goddess Thora, gardening in paradise, came across several trees she thought ugly. As she pulled them out, their thorns pricked her, and in a rage, she tossed the trees over the wall of paradise. Their branches buried in the sand, and their roots grabbed at the sky. This is how the San people explain the strange-looking baobab tree. The legend suggests that the world of the San is outside paradise. The enraged goddess might not appreciate the irony, but the people, fauna, and flora of this area, in the southwest of the African continent, probably do. Their country, Namibia, is a harsh, barren, unforgiving area. But it is also a land of unparalleled beauty. It is a land of dreams and miracles, a country of contrasts and unforgiving elements. It is a land of stone, majestic mountains, and sand dunes hundreds of meters high that shift and slide into the dry riverbed, become desert that likes to keep its secrets. Namibia is an unspoiled paradise of immeasurable and overwhelming space. Vast plains of sand and rock drenched in unrelenting and strangely bronze-colored light. Barren mountain ranges sharply etched against a washed out sky. Deep canyons gashed into the ground as if Thora in her rage determined to torture the very ground. There is an atmosphere of brooding, stillness and solitude. A land where time takes time to tell its story. Only the resilient survive in this unique landscape. Most of them so adapted and specialized for life here that this part of the world may well be paradise for them. Thora must have been artist even in rage. In casting out unwanted flora and features from her garden, she created a vast and unique work of art covering almost 825,000 square kilometers. A massive, enduring and inspiring canvas where beauty can be harsh, where gemstones blossom like flowers and where nature's chemistry set colors the mountain slopes more vividly than any vegetation place where a landslide wounded precipice gushes a rose-colored waterfall of pure quartz. The vast canvas is of subtle and harsh shades, tints and colors that change from moment to moment as the ever-present sun traverses its skies. Broad brush strokes paint large areas in natural hues created by the rich range of minerals in the sand and rock. This vast palette constantly changes and blends its subtle pastels as if by the hand of some idly mortal patiently seeking the perfect yet undiscovered hue. Part painting, part sculpture. Namibia's vast plains of sand and rock, massive dunes, and barren mountain ranges plummet into deep canyons. The art is sometimes chiseled, sometimes forged in anger, and sometimes created in delicate harmony.
vegetation is sparse. Instead of the lush green of many other parts of the world, the pigments on this canvas were produced by igneous, metamorphic and sedimentary processes that form the Earth's rocks. Plants that are at home in this inhospitable area range from the weird to the modest, from the tough to the bizarre. Animals that survive here include both the elegant and the awkward. In a land where running water is hardly ever known, there are also extensive large brine pans that cover the impossible earth. Man is also here, but at less than three persons per square kilometre, they have a lower population density than anywhere in the world, except perhaps Mongolia. The people of Namibia call themselves the Damara, Caprivi, Khoisan, Nama, Uva Hereru, Uva Himba, Ovambo, Rehobo, Topnars, San, Swana. Others are of European descent. Some a legacy of German colonization and adventurers drawn by the forbidding beauty and romance of an environment that does not take kindly to strangers. Ochivambo, Ochihereru, Rukwangali, Nama, Damara, Sulozi, Swana. Even the names of its many languages both ravage and adorn the tongue like a song of nature. Many people here speak at least one other language, including English or Afrikaans, a Germanic language that developed in southern Africa. <laughs> They came to Namibia with dreams in their eyes only to leave those dreams vanquished and tossed in the wind, to be buried in the barren dunes. Namibia's harsh climate is the result of the breakup of the supercontinent Pangai more than 200 million years ago. Its South American counterpart drifted away from it to become the lushly vegetated Brazil across the Atlantic Ocean. A cold current along the southwest African coast conspires with the prevailing winds to keep this sector of the African continent dry. The Namib Desert at 100 million years old is thought to be the oldest desert in the world. It is an utterly arid strip of sun-scorched wilderness, nearly 120 kilometers wide, spanning Namibia's coastline from the north to the south. It is a place of searing winds, sandstorms, 300 meter high dunes, and dense fog that is a gift of water to those fauna and flora that know how to take it directly from the moist air.
When hominids encountered this desert two million years ago, it looked much as it does today. Early nomads made the crossing to the sea, but the difficulty of that experience left a legacy in their language. In Khoisan, the word Namib means a waterless land, harsh, relentless, and desolate. To their ears, calling the area the Namib Desert is an unnecessary repetition. Perhaps the double emphasis is deserved. Those who challenge adversity say this is indeed the desert of deserts. The 1400 kilometer coastline along the Namib is remarkably straight. There are only two commercially significant bays, the fishing ports of Luderitz and Wolfus Bay. The Namib Desert is one of the driest areas in the world. Daytime temperatures in summer usually peak at over 40 degrees Celsius in the extreme south and north of the country. The virtual absence of rainfall in this area serves to make the rain statistics of the country as a whole look even worse than they are. The plants and animals survive from the drops that the thick fog leaves before the sun sucks it dry. With the coming of the night, the sun hides away. No birds serenade its passing or plead for its return. The mist settles down as the sands cool. awesome. It is not unusual for a desert to meet the sea, but here the shoreline, especially along the skeleton coast, is strewn with bleached bones of the fall. The shifting sands expose a natural graveyard. Together with the desolation beyond, you could be forgiven for not guessing it at the rich life beneath the surface of the sea in the Benguela current that flows northward along the coast. Carrying water from the cold southern ocean, it is a haven for prodigious amounts of plankton, fish and crayfish that in turn supports large bird and seal colonies. If the temperature of the Benguela, a body of water wider than the Namib, were to rise by a few degrees, the desert would become a garden, or even a swamp. A difficult speculation in a land so hot. Warped and twisted by incomprehensible, unpredictable changes, this tortured world has survived a long beating from the elements. Indeed, this tough, resilient land receives scant tenderness from nature. Elephant, lion, ground squirrel and rock rabbit 
have adapted to the conditions. Reptiles, including rock lizards and snakes, find refuge below the burning upper layer of sand. Others find shelter in mountain caves. In the hottest weather, the proud oryx, a desert dweller that obtains most of its moisture from plants and occasional dew, migrate to the edge of the desert to find shade. Fittingly, this magnificent survivor is one of Namibia's national symbols. The Namib is home to the side-winding adder and the almost translucent web-footed gecko. The dense fog from which each collects moisture in its own way is the key to their survival. The rare Valvitsia mirabilis, wonderful as its name, is another national symbol that makes its home in the Namib. It is both flowering and cone-bearing and is classified as a gymnosperm, an ancient plant order that includes cycads and conifers. The tangled leaf mass is an illusion, it only has two leaves. The female plants bear greenish-yellow cones banded with reddish browns that are larger than the salmon colored cones of the male ones. The Valvitsia is really a tree that has been stunted by an inhospitable desert. The two opposite leaves last for the life of the plant. Growing outwards from the base, they can reach three meters long. The fibrous taproot is relatively shallow with several lateral roots anchoring the plant just below the soil surface. Poor cousin to the tall spruces and pines of the northern hemisphere, these plants make easy pulling for an angry god. Valvitsias are extremely long-lived. An average specimen is 500 to 600 years old. But carbon dating indicates that larger specimens have survived for over 2,000 years in this harsh habitat. Normally hard and brittle, Lincoln come to life, blooming when water sprinkles them, moving visibly and becoming soft and leathery to the touch. Lincoln is a complex symbiosis of an algae and a fungus. The Namib has more than a hundred species, ranging from windblown types, looking like dead plant material, to the orange tufts of the Telosiasis. They too rely on the fog that blankets the coast for more than a hundred days a year. The flight of the black eagle is emblematic of both the majesty and cruelty of the struggle for food in this harsh, barren land. It ranges the vast plains in search of sustenance for its young. The fall of the weak brings good fortune to the strong, and the eagle must seek and find its fortune before the wind and sand claim it for their own. For all its awesome beauty, the Namib is still a work in progress. It is a dynamic environment that has evolved over millions of years, formed by restless geological forces, and still shaped and reshaped by the continual onslaught of wind, water, and sand. Its splendor is such that one still inquires after the genius hand, the great artist, only to learn once more of Mother Nature and her partnership with Father Time.
Humankind started making an impact on Namibia several thousand years ago, when Stone Age people roamed the inland area up to the edge of the desert. Perhaps the beauty of their surroundings inspired them, because their legacy is also an artistic one. Probably the earliest expression of art found on the African continent was unearthed in a cave in the Hunsberg in the south. Towards the end of the Stone Age, San hunter-gatherers, known to us as Bushmen, lived in scattered groups throughout the country. The earliest signs of the presence of the Khoikhoi immigrants date back 2,600 years. Others including the Hereru, Rehobot Bastas, Hottentot, Top Nas and Nama followed, but seldom penetrated the desert, which remained an almost impossible barrier between inland Namibia and the coast. The northwest region of Namibia includes the Skeleton Coast and the adjoining Kahokafeld, one of the most scenic areas of southern Africa. It has a wealth of breathtaking geological formations and is not surprisingly the treasure house of Sam paintings and engravings. South of Kohokaland lies Damaraland, a land of stark contrasts ranging from high mountains to rolling grasslands and plains littered with rock. Here one finds the well-known and mysterious White Lady of the Brandbach, one of 43,000 rock paintings on Namibia's highest mountain. Every day at sunset, the Brandberg richly repaints its fiery face, revealing why it is known as the Burning Mountain. Its gigantic granite boulders are transformed into masses of fiery orange, reflecting and farewelling for another day the setting sun. The organ pipes, a distinctive series of dolerite pillars carved by wind and sand from antiquity, occupy a small gorge near the burning mountain. Another open-air gallery at Twyfelfontein is thought to be one of the largest collections of rock engravings in Africa. Unidentified antelope represent a quarter of the 2,400 engravings recorded here, together with still familiar oryx and springbok. Europeans first approached this country from the sea. Diego Seo, a Portuguese explorer, was the first European to set foot here in 1486. He planted a cross and named the spot Cape Cross. Had he considered longer, he could have found something more fitting in the music that marks its indigenous place names. Okahanya, Undangwa, Karabit, 
Hobabis, Oshikati, and Tsumib. Their sound celebrating this region's great feeling of peace. Much later, in the 19th century, the Europeans renewed their interest in the Namibian coast. They founded some communities, notably the ports of Valvis Bay and Luderitz. But in 1886, the Germans took control of the entire area, with the exception of the enclave at Valvis Bay. Luderitz lies along the desolate west coast, with its romantic history of diamonds, its ghost towns and beautiful German colonial architecture. Ons het no deep wortels in die land en in die plek hier no 26 jare in Luderitz. Die hawe is no baie meer ontwikkel as voor 5 jare en ons het nieuwe kei net die ander dag opgemaak. A railway worker found a diamond in 1908, and stories of finds like his brought many people to the Namib. There were so many diamonds that when the moon was high on a cloudless night, people would crawl on their hands and knees to collect the shining objects from where they lay. In the rush that resulted, the towns of Kolmanskop and Elizabeth Bay were built. In six years, five million carats, or 1,000 kilograms of diamonds, were recovered from deposits laid down between 90 and 125 million years ago. By 1913, these fields accounted for 20% of the world diamond production. But the good fortune didn't last. Coleman Scott for a few years a thriving town, with 300 German and 800 contract labourers from the north, soon became a ghost town. A sign on an abandoned house still tells the story of when the diamonds ran out. It reads, No rain, no wealth. We abandon ye therefore to the sun, the sand, and the flies. In the Namib, the sand dunes soon reclaim what was theirs, bearing some of the buildings of once bustling settlements up to their roofs. Doors wail on weary hinges, a sorry echo of the human laughter that turned to dashed dreams of fortune long ago. The climate of this harsh region preserves evidence of a lavish lifestyle that sought to recreate the splendor of Europe in an albeit too dry wilderness. Today, silence rests like a giant cloak over the ghost town of Commonscott. Nearby, in the ghostly sister town of Elizabeth Bay, a family of brown hyenas lives among the remnants of the human residents. Now, almost a century later, utensils still lie waiting, anticipating their owner's return. Today you can visit the ghost towns of a former glory and in the intense silence of the desert, perhaps catch the echo of the laughter of a child from a faraway time in the wind.
As for the diamonds, today they are mined from deposits 30 kilometers off the coast of Luritz and in the Orange River, Namibia's most southern border. Namibia currently produces 1.3 million carats per year, more than 8% of the world's current diamond production. Between Luderitz and Aus, a signpost warns one to be on the lookout for horses. The region has one of the few remaining herds of feral horses in the world, and the only ones to have adapted to such harsh desert conditions. Mystery surrounds their origin. Depending on the available grazing, their numbers range between one and three hundred. These unique horses have been isolated for generations and amazingly have been able to solve the vital problem of food and water by adapting. It seems that although there used to be many more than there are now, things may actually have got better for them. From time to time, the remains of over 2,000 horses re-emerge from the sands near Swakopmond. Military archives have revealed that the horses belonging to South African occupation forces were put down after they contracted an infectious bacterial disease. Records have it that in December 1915, a veterinary officer was sent from South Africa with a vaccine. However, his ship was wrecked and he could not reach the forces in time to prevent the shooting of the horses. The desert has its own way of killing germs and viruses. When the shifting sands cover the skeletons, no trace of the preserved horse bones can be found. And then, as easily, they reappear to tell their sad story of 2,000 horses and mules shot with bridle and saddle to halt the spread of the disease. Covering 5 million hectares, the Namib Naukluft Park includes gravel plains with rocky outcrops, an inhospitable sand sea, and the Kusip River, which is choked off by sand dunes before reaching Vulvis Bay and Swakopmond, Namibia's prime seaside resort. From here, the gravel plains extend into the Kusip Canyon. Swakopmond is a preferred holiday destination for Namibians who want to escape the extreme temperatures inland. The German colonial style buildings date back to the early 1900s and it is not only the mild climate, but the lovely pastries and coffee and the German cafes that keep calling visitors back to this lovely oasis in the desert. The dunes between Swakopmund and Volvus Bay are ideally suited to a variety of dune sports. However, off-road driving can leave unsightly tracks, scars that could remain for 50 years or more. To the north, Kenties Bay is a fisherman's paradise, and each year fishermen come from across the world to the rich fishing grounds. There are many routes to Namibia, through the Fish River Canyon and then Luderitz and Namib Nukluf Park, 
or from Valbus Bay and Swakamond, or even from the northwest through Kaukoland. Vintor, the capital city, is situated among the rolling hills of the central highlands. The street names reflect some of the political turmoil that this isolated part of the world suffered too. Here, modern office block contrasts with German colonial buildings and their pitched roofs. Cape Cross Seal Reserve on the Skeleton Coast is a breeding ground for up to 200,000 Cape fur seals. Around mid-October, the bulls arrive to stake out their territories and defend them against intruders in preparation for the arrival of the females. The territories of the successful males eventually contain an average of 7 to 30 females and are maintained for about 6 weeks. By early December the young pups are born with a black coat which they molt between late February and April. The beaches are kept clean by ghost crabs, jackal and brown hyena. Coastal birds find their fill in the Benguela Current's rich plankton and pelagic resources, which also support the seal colonies. Inland, Kaokaland's rugged scenery is one of the world's last untouched wilderness areas. It is a sanctuary for the desert-dwelling elephant and black rhino normally found in savanna and woodland, but here adapted for survival in the desert. Kookaland stretches from the Huanib River to the Kunene. It is famous for its Upapa and Ruakana waterfalls. The area also includes the Mariamfuss, a floodplain that teems with springbok and other antelope and extends for over 50 kilometres. Land is also home to the Otha Himba, a semi-nomadic pastoral people, many of whom still live according to ancient traditions, preserving their ethnic individuality and culture. Puros is one of the best known semi-permanent Himba settlements, but small groups of dome-shaped huts are dotted throughout the area. The Himba is a tribe of semi-nomadic pastoralists, many of whom still maintain ancient traditions. These tall, graceful people protect their skin from the elements by applying a mixture of red oxides, butterfat, aromatic herbs, the resin and bark 
of the Umazumba bush to their bodies. The cream has a practical purpose, and for the women who spend hours rubbing it on, it also enhances their beauty. The visitor might find the unusual smell of the herbs and fat strange, but for the himba, it is a welcome partner in the battle for survival against an unfriendly sun and extreme dry conditions. Hairstyle identifies the unmarried young man. Similarly, each item of clothing and jewellery conveys a specific message. The himba survive on very little, avoiding modern technology and development. Their traditions and respect for their ancestors form the base of their culture. They know their climate and move their herds of cattle and goat from one watering place to another as the seasons demand. Also nomadic are the San people who live in remote areas and cling to their traditional lifestyle. Known also as Bushmen, they are short in stature and have a light, almost yellow skin which has a tendency to wrinkle. They are not a tribe. Their society centres around autonomous clans of between 25 and 60 members. The men are the hunters, usually with bow and arrow, but they use spears as well as snares for smaller game. The larvae of a certain local beetle provides poison for their arrows. Their amazing accuracy as archers makes up for the lighter weight of their weaponry. <laughs> Water is a precious commodity in the desert. After the rains, the sun store water in ostrich shells that they leave at strategic points for later use. During the great dry, the lucky find a root that holds the plant's store of moisture. The Bushmen excel as mimics and storytellers. Their purpose is to entertain and instruct in traditions and hunting skills. But it is the click sounds of their language, representing more than 50 consonants, that fascinates the visitor. To the north is Itasha, the great white place, Namibia's prime tourist attraction. It provides sanctuary for several rare and endangered species of game. The park boasts more than 110 mammal species, but the visitor is unlikely to see more than 20.
Elephants are commonly sighted, but their numbers fluctuate as many migrate out of the park during the wet season. Itosh's elephants are reputed to be the largest in Africa, the tallest measuring 14 feet, 4 meters, at the shoulder. Their tusks, however, are comparatively small because of the deficiencies in their diet and genetic selection. Giraffe are plentiful throughout the park, while the smaller black-backed jackal and ground squirrel are frequently sighted. The enormous African elephant towers above other animals, but it is the baobab that is the undisputed monarch of Namibia. Where it grows, it dominates the landscape, not only by sheer bulk, but also by its commanding appearance and huge, oddly shaped branches. They do indeed look like an upside down tree whose roots grab blindly at the sky. And deep underground, the tangled roots do look as if they were once branches. Because of the severity of its geology, Namibia will always be a destination for those hardy individuals who both obey and respect nature. For the ones that have the privilege to visit, Namibia leaves a unique and lasting impression upon their souls. Namibia is an enduring and inspiring work of art on an unimaginably large canvas. If the San god Thora regarded this area as suitable only for the rejects of paradise, then her sight was limited and her rage merely the instrument of a higher power from whose lofty vantage the finishing touches of a great work could be seen. Namibia, where time itself takes time to stand still and admire the work of ages. <laughs>